All right, um, so we're talking about aging, and we've talked a lot about it's pretty clear how important that aging is to fish management. And so we've talked about the basics behind it. Now we want to talk about uh, some of the potential errors that can come in with aging, some of the ways we can, can measure those and control those, and uh, some protocols for setting up a good aging program. So at any rate, um, take a look at the next presentation where we talk about things like precision and accuracy and how we measure those and how we try to improve those when we're aging fish. Hello. Uh, here to talk to you a little bit about uh, aging errors. In your last lecture, you learned about aging fish and fish management. Uh, this is the cornerstone of most all fish management. It's an essential skill for anyone who wants to manage fish or to work with fish. So last time we talked about how we age things and what, what are different ways that we can age fish. In this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the error that comes with aging and how we track that, how we measure error, how we try to control error. It's uh, basically this, this presentation is about quality control. Well, why worry about it? Of course we're always worried about error. We're scientists. We know that there's experimental error and random error and error that comes into any of the measurements we take. Specifically with aging, we want to worry about it for that. That's the big reason. We always want to be as correct as possible. We want to be as accurate as as possible. That's uh, simply understood in science. Specifically, why do we care about it so much with aging fish? One big reason is that a lot of the modeling that uh, we do nowadays requires valid ages. So if you wanted to, to model fish growth, if you wanted to model a potential uh, new regulation, you need to know things like the growth rate, the mortality rate. All those things depend upon accurate ages. There are a lot of e examples of bad decisions that were based upon poor aging. Uh, for example, the orange ruffy that uh, is a highly exploited commercial fish was thought to live 20 to 30 years. You know, it was thought that it, that it uh, you know, matured early and, and was typical of other marine species. Um, actually, uh, now we think it lives to be a hundred plus years and that has a very large effect on our idea of how to manage the species. As we mentioned last time and as we, we continue to focus upon this idea of accuracy versus precision and when we're talking about fish aging accuracy is the percent of fish that are given the correct age whereas precision is the percent of fish given the same age whether it's one person aging the same fish multiple times, do you give it the same age each time you look at it? Whether it's, excuse me, whether it's uh, two different fish, or two different people looking at the same fish and giving them the same age, um, all these ideas have to do with the precision of the aging estimate. But as always, accuracy is more important. It's more important to have the correct age when you're aging something, but you often need precision to get accuracy. Uh, as described before, here we're shooting at the bullseye and we have precision, so we have repeatability, but we're not accurate. We're not hitting where we're aiming. In this example, we're neither precise nor accurate. We're not hitting where we're aiming and we're hitting in a different place every time. Here is an example of how we can get accuracy with low precision. We're not hitting in the same spot, but on average, if we average these points, they would sort of be in the middle. And the trick here is, is you have to have a lot of points if you want to have the potential to be accurate on average. Here, of course, is the ideal situation where we're both precise and accurate. We're hitting where we aim, and we're hitting that where we aim consistently. So, for aging fish, 
we need to measure both. Both ideas are important. Accuracy is more important, but we need to have an idea of both if we're going to have a valid aging technique. So let's start with accuracy. A word that's often used is called validation, and that is basically determining if your technique is valid or if it correctly ages fish. So it's basically the word that's used for quality control. It's very important. It makes sense, right? It's very important to know if your technique is giving you the correct age, but it's very rarely done. Uh, in this study by the Mission McFarland, they said 3% of the aging, aging studies they looked at actually checked the accuracy. That's extraordinarily low given its importance. Why don't we check the accuracy more often? Well, you'll find out that it's um, very difficult and it's often not possible to check the accuracy. To check the accuracy, you've got to have a known age fish. There's no way around it. You have to have a fish that you know what the age is, independent of aging them with the hard part or whatever technique you're using. Now how do you get a known age fish? Well, the easiest way is to culture them up. Um, then you know when the fish was born, you know how long you've got it, you know what that fish's age is. Um, that's not a great way to do things. Uh, most obviously because culture age fish, although you know their age very accurately, they are in a completely different environment. And the fish's environment has a tremendous amount to do with how well it lays down annuli. So a cultured fish is probably at a different temperature, uh, has a different behavior, certainly has a different diet, and their growth is going to be different. And so although you might be able to use a known age cultured fish to get a, a feel for the accuracy of your technique, it will not be um, very relatable to a fish that's grown up in the wild. The best way to get a known age fish and to test accuracy is to use mark recapture of fingerlings. And this is basically what it sounds like, is that you mark a bunch of fingerlings, which are going to be age zero fish, and then you recapture them over a period of years. And so then whenever you recapture one of these fish, you know exactly how old it is, and that fish has been living in the wild for most of its life. And that's the best way to get a known age fish to use um, to validate your accuracy of your technique. But, of course, this is very uh, expensive and time consuming and difficult. Uh, marking the fish at that size and marking them in a way that they will retain the mark uh, can be difficult. We'll talk about that in, in more detail in a, later, um, in a later lecture. But also then you're relying upon recapturing the fingerlings, which is going to be difficult unless you stock a tremendous number of fingerlings and you put in a tremendous amount of effort and of course every year you're going to have fewer and fewer of those marked fish um, so this is a, a large time and money commitment however uh, the benefits are tremendous and so you know I encourage you if you ever have the opportunity if you're thinking about a long-term study or if you're going to be working on a water body for a long time you might want to think about this to build up a database of known age fish. Now uh, testing the accuracy and validating the accuracy for aging fish is really no different than any other technique that we do as scientists and if you do anything in the lab uh, if you calibrate an instrument or you use a standard solution or anything of that matter that's good uh, laboratory or scientific processes and you should think about validating ages in fish in much the same way it's just a way to ensure the accuracy of your results it can reduce costs for example Buck, uh, Buckmeyer 2002 argued that if you do a good enough job and establish the accuracy of a particular reader on a particular technique then 
you can get by with only having one reader and that can in the long run reduce cost but if you also think about all the good decisions you're going to make and all the good data you're going to get in the long run it has the potential to uh, to pay off in in large dividends now there are other ways to test accuracy that are probably not as good um, or at least not as accessible bomb radiocarbon is more recently used basically looking at a, a stable isotope or uh, a somewhat stable isotope of carbon carbon 14 which has been steadily increasing from uh, 1958 to 1965. I'm not quite sure what those years are significant, but I think it's got something to do with nuclear testing. Like during that time, um, people were were doing testing a lot of nuclear uh, reactions above ground, and in nuclear reactions, that's when you're actually creating new isotopes and new new atoms and things. And so the four, carbon 14 steadily rose and then I imagine around 1965 is when everyone agreed to start doing these things underground and so then you no longer have an, an increase however you've got that nice signature that is absorbed uh, since it's carbon and these are carbon based organisms that radioactive carbon or that isotope of carbon is absorbed into the fish and can be tested for and you can use that to validate a certain year and then use that to test um, the accuracy of your aging technique. For example, um, this technique was used to show that lake sturgeon are very old. This was used to validate the fact that what we suspected is true, that lake sturgeon live a long time. Now you could do a marker capture of adults, which is much more common. It's easier to capture the adults, it's easier to mark them. We do mark recaptures for a lot of reasons, but realize, excuse me, that this does not validate the age. All this does is validate the annulus formation. And so if you mark a fish, you know when you marked it, you catch it two years later, you know that you put on at least two annuli. And so then you can see if you can clearly see at least two annuli. Or perhaps if it's something like a sturgeon where you can take a fin clip from one fin when you capture it the first time, then when you recapture it, you can take a fin clip from the other fin. You again, you know, you know how many annuli should be on the, the most recent fin clip relative to the, the first fin clip, and that'll help you answer the question, you know, is this really an annulus? Is, is what I'm calling an annulus actually an annulus? So that's useful. Um, you always want to make sure that what you think is an annulus is actually laid down once a year. But this does not validate the actual age as it does with a, a marked recapture fingerling.